As you can see, we have a, a powerful uh, group uh, for that. We have the Aviation Center Commander, we have the Maneuver Center Commander, we have the Special Operations Aviation Command, and we have the Commandant from the Artillery uh, Center. So it's, it's a great uh, group uh, for this discussion. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, doing that here. And each of the members here to my right, your left, will uh, do an initial overview of the topic. Um, and I understand Huntsville is online this morning, so a shout out to them who are in Overwatch this morning. Glad that they could join us. And so uh, let me turn this over to uh, our first uh, uh, commander, uh, Major General Gaylor, and he will begin uh, the discussion and we'll go, we'll go right down the line. So and, uh, we, as we had coordinated prior to this, we, we found that we usually talk way too much in the opening salvos. Uh, and then we get like 10 minutes for questions between the four of us, so we're going to keep this relatively short each. Um, I think what is helpful is uh, the fact that when, when TRADOC and when our Army put so much time into describing a future operating environment, uh, there's potentially some necess uh, not necessarily agreement in every area, but we have a common understanding about some of the greatest threats that we're going to face. We know will be contested. Uh, we know there'll be integrated air defense. We know there'll be an urban component. So I think uh, how we kind of set uh, our formations to operate in that environment is pretty important. Uh, I talked a little bit about the relationship of variables of size, speed, range, power, payload, endurance, et cetera. Uh, but I always, I mean, I, I want to emphasize the fact that it's not about any value of one or two. It's about how all of those come together to introduce capability. Um, and I think I'm going to end it there. There will be plenty of questions here. So, Eric, over to you. I'm going to go a little longer, if that's okay. Um, he did hold me at three minutes, so I'm sure I'll go no more than five or ten. Um, so let me, I guess what I want to start with, a lot of talk on acquisition, naturally, given, given the environment that we have here. But up front, you know, this very first forum that we're going to lay out here is the future of movement and maneuver. And, and you might ask yourself, okay, why, why would, if I'm in the industry realm and I'm looking for requirements, why do I need to understand movement and maneuver? And it really goes to this concept that Bill was talking about earlier on the understanding of relationships. And I'd lay it out for you like this. When the programs of record that we all knew and loved when we were growing up was in an era where technology changed at a more linear rate, technology was dominated by nation states, and we knew who our enemy was. And, and all three of those things are no longer true because technology changes at an exponential rate nation store rather technology proliferates and the enemy is is much less clear so that's relevant to you understanding movement and maneuver because we know there will be rapid change and in order to change rapidly we need industry operating in parallel with us and rather in the, the days of the requirements being thrown over the transom to industry and making a development i think are past but rather industry needs to be participating alongside of us. So understanding how we want to maneuver enables you to be agile um, within that development environment. Very quick, I just wanna lay out the, the, the concept in terms of the framework so, you, so we can have a discussion here and I'll tease out some, maybe some points that will drive discussion. Um, the first is we know that our peers have been studying us for the last 20 or 30 years or so, and, and here's the conclusion they've come to, and that is they do not want to fight us in the close fight. For the last 20 years or so, the American way of war is that we identify who our opponent will be, we take six months to stack metal in that theater, and when we're ready, we go across LD and we fight and every peer of ours knows they want no part of that. So, so what they've done in terms of their investments, in, if I could put it in a word, is to create standoff that precludes our advantage in the close fight. And that comes down to everything from the A2AD domes that they've built and invested in, long range, precision, mast, fires, um, EW, cyber, um, their emphasis on phase zero to two, and hybrid warfare. All of those are designed to keep us out of the close fight, to keep us at a distance. 
And you add to that the fact that we are strategically out of position, we've got a massive problem because one of three things has to happen. Either we have to be forward deployed, we have to read the tea leaves early and get deployed early, or we have to fight our way into theater. That's a different way of fighting. So very quickly, four components of the solution at the brigade level anyway, we have to be able to conduct cross-domain maneuver because no longer can we be assured that we will dominate in all domains. In fact, we know we will not. The second thing is we have to be able to operate semi-independently. And with the, because of the hyperactive nature, the non-contiguous battlefield, brigades will have to fight semi-independently. Third, integrated reconnaissance security operations across echelons. And then finally, um, mission command on a scale that our peer group has never seen. So just as a teaser for you, you, you got to build your army against the enemy threat that you see. You have to have a pacing threat, which I think we've moved away from capabilities towards a pacing threat now. But you have to build your army against that. You can't build your army based on, on the past. So the question, just a rhetorical one, and then I'll pass it on, is, is our current focus on aviation capability sets correct? Is it, is, it, does, is it a focus that reconciles the threat that I just described? And if it does, that's good. If it doesn't, we might want to revisit where our priori priorities are with respect to Cape Set 3, Cape Set 1, whatever the case may be. So with that, I just want to make sure we're focused on the threat. I'll hand it over to General Evans, and I look forward to your questions. Hey, thanks, sir. I appreciate it, uh, and appreciate an opportunity to speak to everybody today. One of the things I want to kind of uh, tease out immediately is the fact that uh, you know, we, are a, we are a separate but integral element of what Army Aviation is in the RSOAC. So Army Special Operations Aviation, as I often say, as goes Army Aviation, so goes the RSOAC. And I will tell you, and, and, I'll, and I'll ask uh, my good friend Bill Gaylor to grade my homework here, as we take a look at the Aviation Six Pack, and I know we've got former Six Pack members in the audience here, so don't be offended by this, but I think we have the closest relationship I've ever seen with regards to our level of cohesion and cooperation. And that's not because we're better buddies than some of you folks were when you had those jobs, but it's because our current environment has forced us into this cohesiveness, and we cannot afford to be separated from each other. So there are areas where we are leading Army Aviation in our SOA. There are places where we are side by side with Army Aviation, and there are places where we are trailing behind to see which direction Army Aviation is going to go so that we can support them. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's an important distinction. One of the things that General Wesley said, uh, I've got, I literally have almost written down word for word here in my own text, and that is, you know, our enemies have gone to school on our American way of war for the last 27 years. Uh, and one of the things that they've done, uh, is uh, they've, they've recognized that in many cases, when uh, we move into conflict, uh, it is special operations forces that are leading the way to set the conditions for more decisive maneuver operations, which means they've already begun to target our infiltration methods, which by and large have been through rotary wing infiltration. So already I feel a bullseye on my force as we take a look at our most advanced potential adversaries and how we're going to react, but we still have to find a way to be able to get in and set conditions to present multiple dilemmas to our enemies across all the domains so that decisive ground maneuver can get in and win the fight. And that's, that's one of the things that we're the most focused on. Um, my boss focuses on four value propositions, if you will, for ARSA, for Army Special Operations Forces. The first of those is that although there are other people who do this in the Army, we, these are kind of our core competencies. First is, is the use of the indigenous approach. And what we're doing at the RSOAC with regards to that is we are doing aviation, foreign internal defense, and security force assistance with other nations in the world so that they might build capacity to be able to conduct aviation operations across the spectrum that will again free up our forces from having to do some of those critical missions if we find ourselves in coalition battle. And I can't imagine a situation in the future where we will not find ourselves with coalition partners going alone in a unilateral fight. So this is incredibly important to us. The second is precision targeting. I think everybody is uh, pretty well aware, if you watch the news, if you read books, that uh, SOF has gotten very, very good and very adept at precision targeting, locating, finding, fixing, and finishing the enemy on the battlefield. We're a very, we play a very major role in that uh, in the RSOAC. Uh, one of the things that we do, uh, and this is much more about soft ground forces than it is about aviation, but we do it as well, 
is we develop situational awareness and we wield influence. So we've got people stationed all across the AORs right now in all of the combatant commands that are working with indigenous forces and they are sensing what is going on in those spaces so that we can report back and help develop the situation for the entire joint force and at the same time where we can do so we try to take our national interest our secretary's priorities and push those forward with our partners so they understand what we're trying to accomplish for the collective good against our potential adversaries and then finally what we do is uh, we are crisis responders we generally have the ability the means and the resources to get there first uh, and begin to develop the situation before we can close with decisive forces. And that's a very, very important responsibility for us because, as General Wesley pointed out, we have drawn back over the last 25 years, not expanded out, and it will take time to get decisive force, maneuver force, to the fight. So, uh, so we focus on doing that. Um, we are committed to being able to set the conditions for movement maneuver on the battlefield. It's one of the things that we practice the most, and we will stay committed to that. Before I pass the mic off, I want to offer one challenge because I know we've got many of our industry partners here in the room. We've talked about the acquisition process, how frustrating that can be. We've talked about where we need more agility in that space across the board, uh, not just in the aviation environment. But I will push forward the same challenge that I did last April for those who uh, were there to hear me at uh, Quad A, and that is as we develop systems that are more sophisticated and more capable, we need to keep in mind that the future battlefield is not going to give us the advantage of having contractors and FSRs in our spaces all the time. So we have got to build systems that properly trained, equipped, and supervised 10 and 20 level soldiers can fix and get back in the fight. So that's my challenge to industry, and I know that's hard as we start to look at some of the technology that's involved, but if we can't fix it and get it back in the fight, it's not going to be any good to any of us. So I appreciate your time, and I'll pass it off to Steve. Well, good morning, everybody. And, and first of all, I want to thank the AUSA leadership and General Gaylor for uh, including the EFCO in this uh, this panel. Um, it's great to to be one of the variables that's uh, considered in the relationship thereof. So, as General Gaylor said earlier on, you know, um, it, it's all about support to the uh, to the infantrymen and the maneuver uh, out on the uh, pointy end of the spear. And so it's no surprise that the Army functional concept for fires that's being worked uh, places a priority on support to uh, the Joint and Combined Arms Maneuver Commander. The fires tenants, um, and I apologize, I, I guess I'm the only one with a slide, uh, but it's, it's probably not a surprise that uh, you'll see that nested within our chart it are the tenants that uh, General Wesley uh, brought up and uh, some graphics that were created at the MCO. Because as we decided uh, how we were going forward with our functional concept for fires, uh, we we're fully nested within that. And so not a surprise that we want to continue to be precise in the future. We want to continue to be effective. We want to continue to be responsive. Uh, as we evolve and look at the future OE and how we'll incorporate with the maneuver tenants laid out by uh, the MCO, uh, we want to be able to expand our capability for cross-domain fires, and the aviation community has a huge piece in that. How we interact with the, um, the pilot in the cockpit, how do we establish sensor-to-shooter links, how we become more multifunctional, both within the fires architecture of FA and ADA, combining uh, to, uh, to have some convergence of capabilities, but also how we uh, combine with the aviation force of um, uh, being able to be a sensor for us on the battlefield. And of course, uh, we also want to be able to link, uh, to leverage our linkages with the um, fires capabilities in the gym, uh, whether that be with our multinational partners or interagency. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that, uh, uh, as General Gaylor said, leave optimum time for questions and I uh, look forward to uh, answering them. Well, let me uh, start the opening question with. Um uh, what are the thoughts on how you see the future battlefield? What are the capabilities in your respective portfolios critical to that success um, in the new operating environment that we foresee? So I think probably each of you has uh, a role in answering that question. Sure. I, I, I will lead this one off because um, 
I like to say often, hey, the, probably the number one um, capability for the aviation portfolio on the future battlefield uh, is long-range precision fires. Because without some complementary uh, fires followed by short-range air defense, um, we are all vulnerable as a total force. Um, so uh, when we think specifically about uh, an aviation capability, uh, I think that we have to understand that we need to um, be agile and have maneuverability in the target area because uh, in our service we fight in the environment. It's Aviation is not a means of transportation. It is a platform that we fight. Um, we know we're going to be in urban areas so and in a highly contested air defense uh, scenario potentially, so survivability is important. Uh, and that's back to the relationship of variables, you know. Just going faster is not necessarily interesting. Just being quicker, just having longer range is not necessarily interesting, but it's the combination of attributes that lend to survivability for the purpose of our being more lethal. In the lethal realm, um, I think we have to continue to pursue munitions that go much farther than our current munitions strategies take us. Uh, I think we have to have the ability to carry more stowed kills on board um, in smaller precision-guided munitions. Uh, I think we have to, in this balancing readiness today with the future, I think we have to, we have to make some good enough decisions about some programs. Um, what is good enough in a aviation survivability equipment realm? What is good enough in a degraded visual? What is good enough in uh, you pick the area? And then we have to make tough decisions so that we can enable the longer range precision capabilities, the carrying more stowed kills, the being more survivable on the battlefield. Uh, that is kind of my thoughts on it. Thanks, Bill. So I, <clears throat> I think what I'll do is I'll pick two of those components of the solution that are relevant uh, to aviation to a degree, I think. First is cross-domain maneuver. If, if you haven't been studying it, you might say, well, what, what, is, what do we mean by cross-domain fire, fires? What do we mean by cross-domain maneuver? We say cross-domain maneuver as it relates to the movement maneuver concept what we are doing is up front, we're, we are acknowledging that for the first time maybe in our experience, that our Army will, does not dominate all domains all the time. Um, air superiority and air supremacy might not be that which we uh, can enjoy. So what cross-domain maneuver says is that the maneuver commander, in order to break down or to, uh, in order to attrit the enemy's coherence in his A2AD uh, dome, might require this, that is to select certain decisive space, new term, decisive space, where you would create synergy or optimize all five domains or critical mass thereof in order to achieve overmatch. That is that I can't, I can't necessarily expect that fires and or air will prep the objectives in support of ground maneuver so that I can then maneuver on the objective. That I've got to use EW, cyber, um, air, or ground in order to create a, a, uh, a sum of the whole that exceeds all the <laughs> individual parts that creates that overmatch. The second factor is that we have to realize that whereas in the past air may have enabled ground, we will see environments where ground will enable air or where cyber will enable air, which will then enable ground. But there's this cyclic effort in the decisive space where you've got to break down the integrity of the standoff they've created. So that cross-domain maneuver is critical. And if you can imagine your maneuver commander, um, in the era we grew up, you had to synchronize, for the most part, two domains, air and ground. And it, was, it could be done on a linear flat map. But imagine trying to tra train a staff to create synergy and synchronization, which might be in question, 
across five domains, all of which move at different rates. The second component I guess I think is critical in the future battlefield is this idea of semi-independence. If you have a hyperactive battlefield, if you have uh, formations that are increasingly dispersed, and you add on top of that the fact that the enemy will be attacking our ability to communicate, and the fact that you have this hyperactivity, you can imagine you have nothing but semi-independence. So some have, have challenged us, what do you, you know, can you really do this semi-independent thing? Well, whether I can or not is not something I can evaluate as a component. We have to be able to operate semi-independently. And that has implications for resourcing, sustainability, and anything that we put into the development process has to look at power generation and power management over time. So those are two things I don't want, I could go on and on, but those are two that I would highlight for the purpose of that question. So, so I would add, uh, I won't hit uh, fires and survivability a whole lot more than General Gaylor has, but I'll tell you it's very important for us, obviously. Chances are, in any conflict, we are going to go deep, we're going to penetrate IADs, and we're going to have to have fires that support us doing that, all types of fires, and, and frankly, all types of seed, lethal and non-lethal. Uh, but I would add to that that we've got to work on ways to reduce our signature. So some of that is, is things we need to relearn. Uh, you know, when I grew up in Army aviation, particularly as a night stalker, my standard was time on target, plus or minus 30 seconds, and zero alum in bad weather, handling the first level contingency without ever squeezing a radio trigger. We've gotten away from that. Too often, we've got people that are going for that radio button, and every time you do that, you're sending a signal out on the battlefield. So we've got to relearn some things that we knew once and get back to signature reduction. And then there's all other aspects of that, too, IO, RF, visual, audible, uh, things that can really help us from a survivability standpoint. And then I think the other thing that we've got to do better, and this is, this is much more a training thing than it is an, uh, a technology thing, is we've got to be, I'm, I'll use the, the word learnable. So it, it's kind of adaptive, if you will, but in my mind, learnable. We've got to learn what the enemy is doing and adapt our uh, ways to stay ahead of their decision cycle. Right now, we, we operate on SOPs that are very, very important to how we conduct operations, uh, but we tend to be a little bit lockstep in, in adhering to those because we have had the luxury of being able to adhere to our SOPs and not worry about what the enemy is doing in response. I can tell you our future adversaries are going to confound us with some of the things they do, and we have got to be more agile in the way we think, and we've got to be a learnable force as we move forward. So I'll kick it over to Steve. So with regards to how we see the OE, um, General Wesley laid it out pretty well. Peers uh, acting through proxies, hiding behind false narratives, dense urban terrain, enemies who uh, build capabilities or have built them already to specifically challenge U.S. perceived strengths and uh, offset U.S. capabilities through A2AD strategies. So uh, the, the key elements of our portfolio in the fires world, um, agility, uh, we've got to have adaptable fires formations capable of synchronizing both lethal and non-lethal effects virtually in any time in any space on the battlefield at echelon. Uh, we've got Devortes back in the formation. Those will evolve uh, in the future into what we plan to be uh, multifunctional FA air defense formations, division fires commands. We've got to reintroduce a capability at the core level to be able to, uh, to do that uh, for the core commander. And we uh, also have an O&O &O out there for the theater level to be able to, uh, to work for the Joint Forces Commander of the GCC. We've got to be able to coordinate and synchronize SEMA, uh, non-lethal fires, as part of our toolkit. Uh, clearly, uh, that's at echelon. Uh, as General Gaylor said, uh, precision, extended range cannon artillery, but um, uh, the long range precision fires LRPF, which is our ATACMS replacement. Um, we've got to get that program uh, moving as quickly as we can and be agile in the acquisition process to, to optimize the speed at which we can get that out to the force. Uh, but also, we've got to extend our range of our uh, MLRS rockets as well uh, from what they currently are able to do to be able to uh, give uh, the type of reach that both our maneuver and um, uh, ground maneuver and, uh, and air maneuver uh, colleagues will need. We've got to have integrated sensor to shooter network capability, uh, matching weapons to target, shortening and flattening the kill chain. Uh, we've got to have um, 
uh, precision dismounted devices that are able to connect directly to aphids, and we've got to get good at that digital uh, linkage from the sensor to the shooter without intervention point. And as we look at what munition capabilities we don't have out there, we've had some great conversations last night even about uh, some things that we can do to, um, to provide uh, capability to the aviation going deep, whether that be uh, a, a missile or a rocket that's got um, a billion pieces of chaff in it that, that blind the enemy to, to allow uh, that capability, whether it be loitering munitions, whether it be artillery delivered ISR, uh, all things that we're thinking about as capabilities to support uh, the future battlefield and how the fire force can enable maneuver. All right, the next question is for uh, General Gaylor. Um, how does the Army go about defining industry standards for plug-and-play capabilities? What are the current hurdles to establishing such standards? Will concepts like FACE help toward that end? And others may want to comment on this also. So uh, I, it, it certainly is uh, kind of difficult to define the standard. I think sometimes because we chase what we think is possible rather than snapping a chalk line and saying, hey, uh, bandwidth processing speed capacities at this period of time is what we want to field with the ability to update later. Um, what we're also trying to do is to develop uh, this notion of a standard of record for uh, an A kit as a means to rapidly grow, rapidly introduce capability. So ideally, you would only need to upgrade a processor, which is pretty easy to upgrade, pretty low touch time, so you don't have to bring airframes in for major maintenance. You would only potentially have to change a sensor that is a couple of screws and a wire connection, so that's not going to be that challenging to do. The hardest to actually solve is what is the bandwidth and capacity of the backbone of the A kit, um, because that is the element that you know causes the greatest maintenance downtime and loss of training time to kit out an airframe with wiring. Um, so uh, that that is uh, the challenge is really that one component. What is the fastest way? And if if it's the fastest today, well, I mean, you can still actually go on with a modem and dial up onto the internet right now. It still works. It doesn't work great, but for about a decade there, it worked plenty good. So if we can keep from touching the aircraft and replacing those wiring harnesses every 10 years, five years, that's victory. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, so any of you have uh, anything on your programs, John? No, I, I think you covered it. I, I think we really do need to think about um, addressing capability uh, and and help turn our acquisition system more uh, uh, from program of record type approaches to a capability gaps type approach. So anything we can do to, to allow us to standardize our approach there uh, is important. I think I think face is is maybe a tool for doing that, uh, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the panacea that we need uh, as we as we move forward. We know it's a difficult problem for industry to try to standardize their approach on these things. But uh, I think what General Gaylor laid out is the way we, we need to be moving. The, uh, the next question is for uh, the Maneuver Center of Excellence, um, although I think this is going to spark some discussion across the panel here. Is there a requirement for a small manned helo within your infantry and armor formations, brigade combat teams? So I think that's relevant to um, maybe my my opening remarks in terms of are, are we focused right with the right cape set uh, efforts. But let me, let me back up and, and, and uh, sort of frame it this way. We, we, two examples, uh, deep strike attack aviation or air assault operations. We, we think and consider that striking deep is the way you do things. We take it as, a, as natural. We're used to it. 
Um, but it doesn't really have, frankly, a lot of um, history to it beyond um, the conclusions of the Battlefield Development Plan published by General Starry. Because the conclusion was that we couldn't defeat a uh, uh, Soviet threat that was significantly outnumbering us. So the question in the 1970s was, how do you solve this problem? Well, you can go buy more tubes and go buy more tanks and match them tube for tube, tank for tank. But there's another way to skin that cat in a, in a um, uh, budget-constrained environment, and that is what we all know is fight outnumbered and win. Defeat the enemy in depth so you don't have to meet him face to face. So if you're in World War I, you really didn't have a deep fight for the most part. Um, but, but we need, knew we had to defeat him in depth and fight outnumbered and win. Ergo, deep strikes. So we assume that that is our nature because that's the way we grew up. Um, in an environment where we do not have air superiority or air supremacy, we have to ask ourselves, is that um, as essential, given the constraints of now, as it was then? So that's a question. Alternatively, I laid out this problem we have with a significant standoff that the enemy is invested in with respect to their A2AD domes. The name of that game right now is to get into theater and to penetrate that dome. So what we need, I think, at, in the, at the formation level, brigade level, is reconnaissance and followed by attack. But um, the old look at deep strike looks a lot very airland battle-ish, which is not cross-domain maneuver or multi-domain battle. So I think we need to look at light or look lighter towards both the heavy and light formation. You, you couldn't have teed that up any better. Um, so the Army's number one need in our vision is an armed reconnaissance helicopter. The joint number one need is the assault variant Cape Set 3 helicopter. Um, and I'm going to add a tiny bit to how, to how Eric unpackaged that. And I, I think you have to think, too, about reconnaissance a little differently than we grew up thinking about reconnaissance. So I, I think when we grew up thinking, hey, I want to define, describe, gather information about terrain and enemy that will provide reaction time and maneuver space for a commander to make decisions and employ forces, uh, it's a little more complicated than that today because now there is an electronic EW component, an emitter component, an RF, a uh, cyber component to reconnaissance. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to occupy terrain, and you're going to need to know information about that terrain and about the enemy that you are about to face. You still have to fight for that information. Um, and I think it is best suited uh, with a, a capability set, one armed reconnaissance helicopter augmented with some unmanned capabilities or sensor collect emitter map capabilities that can across the spectrum gather that information for a commander. Um, we, this, this path though we're on has been for a while. So to shift gears is, you know, challenging, uh, but we are interested in how to do both. We already said we don't have money until we buy out Apaches and buy out Blackhawks. Uh, but our intent is still, you know, our Army, the capabilities we need for the ground commander is both Cape Set 1 and Cape Set 3. So swing away. Sir, if I could just add on a, <laughs> a small piece to that. So, I mean, reconnaissance, uh, I mean, we, we think of ISR, uh, you know, as we – as we look to extend the range of the battlefield deeper and deeper and uh, be able to kill the enemy at depth, as we just we talked about, uh, we've got to be able to use technology uh, and realized mission command to be able to go beyond ISR and go into ISRTA. And we've got to be able to acquire targets at depth, and we've got to be able to use technology to route those targets back to uh, those that it will service them so that we can open those windows of opportunity for the maneuver force. 
Let me add just one thing, because this is the one place where I kind of depart from the larger Army Aviation Force with regards to roles and missions, and that is I still have a compelling requirement to have a small assault helicopter for some of the uh, type of fighting that we do in the, uh, in the RSOF and in the Joint SOF Force. Because we're looking at um, potential targets in the future that may be large mega cities or urban areas, the ability to be able to get a small helicopter into those areas and uh, insert surgical special operations teams uh, is still something that uh, my ground force wants to see. So we don't do reconnaissance with our small helicopter. But we're certainly joined at the hip with the Army and taking a look at what the future of, uh, of that type of vehicle is going to be. Hey, one, one last uh, kind of add-on, because it's relevant. Um, as we look at what we think we need to be able to do in the future, we also have to be agile enough to change in stride. So if General Wesley says, hey, the squad and the future to be semi-independent is of X size and has X capabilities, we need to be agile enough to say, okay, well, then we need to change how we're looking at this particular capability set and what its payload, what its cabin size, what its capacity is. If it grows, then we have to make some tough decisions. If it scales down, we have to make tough decisions. So again, we're part of the maneuver functional concept, so that will drive how we view it. Uh, this question was for uh, Major General uh, Wesley, but it may already been uh, partially answered. How does Maneuver Center of Excellence uh, envision adjusting its maneuver strategies to fight in dense urban environments, uh, especially small units? And I think we touched on this, but there may be more discussion on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm hesitating because I'm, I'm, I'm not always a party line guy. Um, so we oftentimes avoid cities because they are really, really hard. And I'm not convinced we want to abandon that approach just yet. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I will say a couple things about this. First is um, my sense is that most urban fights are very tactical anyway. So as we look at the fact, you know, how we would change the way a squad or a platoon engages in the very tight quarters that they'll be moving in, I'm not convinced that there's an operational impact to the degree um, that requires us to change the way we conduct our tactics. But I do believe that what we have to do is we've seen over time, what we've seen is capabilities continue to migrate lower and lower and lower. So if you go back hundreds of years, um, your, your capabilities were very limited on the individual soldier. Now, because of technology and it's a, your ability to package it, you're, you have the ability to push those capabilities down to the squad and preclude their dependence on higher echelons, which is important given the fact that we will have to be semi-independent at times. So, for example, if we can get fire control into the squad, which we, haven't, we don't have to this day, um, that may preclude the need for attack aviation or mortars in support of a squad in an urban environment, thereby reducing collateral damage effects. So th if there's anything we're doing at the Maneuver Center, it's that we want to migrate capability down to the squad and platoon level that relieves the burden of attack aviation or indirect fires from supporting those squads in a very tight environment. Anybody else? All right, uh, next question. As uh, IHADs grow more lethal, do, any, do, uh, uh, do Army troops need to rely less on aviation, close air support, and more on rocket artillery? And I guess we'll go to our artillery panel. So I think the, uh, the answer is uh, if that is the operating environment, then, uh, then yes. Um, the, the role that we see uh, playing on the battlefield uh, in the, the future operating environment is opening windows of opportunity in an A2AD environment until an IADS can be um, uh, withered and mitigated uh, to the point that we can uh, operate in an environment that's more conducive to, to what we know now. 
but in an integrated air and missile defense environment that uh, a, a pure adversary would, would face, I mean, in order to be able to enable the maneuver commander to uh, employ all assets available, we've, we've got to give our aviators the opportunity to get deep. We've got to give our Air Force colleagues the ability to get uh, deep and help to shape the battlefield. And certainly, um, you know, not just suppressing air defense, but instead of see dead, uh, destroying enemy air defense, I think, is the number one priority for long-range artillery as we, uh, as we start in an environment like that. Thanks, Steve. So, so I, I would, um, I would reject the notion that the IADS is completely prohibitive for our aviation force today to operate it. Um, we have great capabilities today, but at great risk. Um, and that's kind of uh, what we're trying to do is to regain an overmatch capability to dominate in an area because we have the ability to do it. If we had to go fight tonight, we have great capabilities, but we will take losses. But if we have the ability to do something about mitigating those losses, we should, and shame on us if we don't. But every time someone says, hey, aviation's not going to play in the future battlefield because of IADS is completely and utterly false, because we will. Uh, there are things we do in training and things that we do that have nothing to do with a component we strap on the aircraft that enables us an ability to operate. It's a training issue. Uh, it's convenient, though, to say you're not going to operate, so let's look to take money from you so we can put it to some other program. Uh, so first, I reject the notion that you're not going to be able to operate. Secondly, if, if you buy into a notion of the Army's operating concept that says we have to be able to present an enemy with multiple dilemmas from multiple directions and multiple domains to create challenge for him or her, not us, then you should never acquiesce any domain and any capability. You have to fight in it. You must because you want to create challenge for the enemy, not for ourselves. If you one-dimensionally try to solve that problem, it will not be successful. That was well said. I appreciate that, Bill. The only thing I would add very simply is um, I don't think it's an either or issue. We definitely need to rely more on long range precision fires and rocket artillery, but that doesn't mean we need to rely less on aviation. We've got a huge gap from about 90 kilometers out to 30 kilometers out where we are exceedingly vulnerable to our peers, um, and that requires long range precision fires. The only thing I would add to that is I think we tend to be a little binary sometimes is the way we look at things. You know, we've got People think, okay, we're going to defeat this with aviation, and we're going to use long-range fires, and then maneuver forces are going to close. This, this truly is, in my mind, multi-domain battle at its best. So we've got guys in space that are working this problem for us. We've got guys in cyber that are working this problem for us. We've got guys on the ground, flying helicopters, guys in high flyers. Uh, it is a, a multi-domain environment, and we've got to bring everything we can to bear on it because, like General Gaylor was saying, even though we've got to operate in contested environments, when we do have control of the air, we are very, very effective at what we're doing on the ground. Question for, uh, question for General Gaylor. Uh, earlier you mentioned better, faster, cheaper. You also said that aviation is looking for best in class for capabilities. Does this mean aviation is prepared to move away from or redefine LPTA? I assume that's the contracting term there. Whoever asked the question, tell me what LPTA is, because I have no idea. What was it? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Which is uh, just an incredible way of actually buying stuff, right? Yeah, I would give me the cheapest, you know, minimally acceptable thing, and that's going to work for us in the future. Um, so I would say, yeah, absolutely. In in all of our contracts, I, I would love to see us go away from that, but that's. Probably a, a question better answered by Thomas Todd, who lives in that world and does that for a living. Um, but I would tell you, uh, the, 
the better, cheaper, faster comment is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little uh, kind of cliche, but it's there's some truth to it. When when we say, hey, I want to buy this thing, and then suddenly its price goes up to five million dollars per item, uh, that just became prohibitive. It's better, cheaper, or uh, better, faster, heck of a lot more expensive therefore made of unobtainium, and we're not going to pursue it. Uh, we are not in a budget environment that gives us flexibility. So that's why the better, faster, cheaper comment. Uh, of course, it'll drive us to look at contracts differently, and I'll let Thomas handle that when he gets up to swing on his panel. <laughs> uh, next question. Um does this thing go to lunch? <laughs> <laughs> we're we're still uh, we're still on schedule here. Based on changes in the operating environment, do you foresee more ta tailorable, sustainable organizations, such as the ACR was designed for, uh, to present uh, multiple dilemmas? Um, more composite organization, uh, train as you fight, and of course. Having been uh, in the cavalry most of my career, you know, where you had scouts, guns, lift, blues, and H-series organizations that came out of Vietnam, that, that uh, reminds me of how we used to do this. So whoever wants to take that on. This is a, an interesting question, particularly the way it was laid out. Um, you know, as, as you all know, there are different tribes within an institution. And um, the one who's most successful is the one who can align tribes to their end um, most effectively. Um, there are some that I want to go back to the ACR be for nostalgia, right? Um, that's not a good reason. But if, the, if, if a lot of the ACR tools are helpful in a semi-independent environment, I don't really care if it's for nostalgic reasons or not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to align with that. So um, I, we have some great cavalrymen who are wanting to bring back the, the ACRs. I, I, we are endorsing... Um, the current uh, pilots in order to look at our capacity to do that, but for different reasons. At, at the Maneuver Center, the reason we believe that we've got to um, reconsider those kind of formations is because you have a larger um, quantity of organic capabilities within the organization that is very consistent with a formation that has to fight semi-independently. So I, I find um, the, the ACR question interesting because it is moving on a path consistent with where we have to go. So the semi-independent brigades in a cross-domain maneuver environment have to have organic capability that exceeds what we have now. If a brigade is independent and they are receiving long-range precision fires and they don't have connectivity to higher echelon artillery, they have to have an ability to respond to that. Now, the degree to which we can integrate that, we're, we're working through, but we want to increase capabilities within the brigades. That increases the, the requirements in terms of training, scope, span of control for a brigade commander. But again, it's not an issue of whether I want to do it. It's a, it's a factor that we have to do it. So from the fire's perspective, I agree with everything uh, General Wesley just said. You know, the, uh, the force that we had back in the 80s of 145, 150 battalions, uh, much larger battalions than the 98 that we currently have in our formation, uh, of which 60% uh, reside within the Guard, including all of our echelons above brigade, uh, cannon artillery, have really reduced our ability to, uh, to tailor a force to be able to be flexible uh, to, to use support relationships and command relationships to support um, the flexibility to the maneuver commander. And so, you know, as we look to what the force ought to uh, be in the future, uh, it, the idea of bringing back the, the capacity within divisions by adding, um, you know, potentially um, a rocket battalion back in each division again to give the division commander something uh, with which they can mass, which which they can weight the main effort, with which they can use support relationships to uh, to give an ACR-like formation or a BCT that's given a particular mission uh, that extra um, oomph that they need uh, that uh, you know fights against the the tenant of maximum feasible uh, centralized control that artillerymen feel so comfortable with. You know the modern battlefield uh, is going to drive us to. 
uh, to explore more uh, autonomous uh, capabilities within formations. Uh, but in order to do that, we've got to have the formations to be able to, to weight those main efforts and to weight those uh, initiatives. So capability, absolutely. You would want that capability. I think what will be interesting in the debate is uh, how many BCTs are we going to bring down to make that capability? How many other formations do we bring down to build the fire's capacity? How many other formations do we bring down to bring in a logistical capability? Uh, because the reality is today you, you could not put an aviation formation in there and be maneuverable. You couldn't, you couldn't move your own formation. Uh, you can move the helicopters, you can't move the equipment. Uh, so it doesn't become very uh, expeditious, I would say, uh, or expeditionary. So the capability you would certainly want to explore to see if it's additive, uh, but we have some very tough decisions ahead if we decide to go that route, uh, frankly. Yeah, if, if I can, and I agree with what Bill said, and so you, you may have to limit the, the degree to which you could field um, more or uh, brigades with organic capability that, like we're describing. But a mo another point that to, to take us off the scent of a core reconnaissance capability called an ACR is the fact that we don't expect the battlefield to be as uh, uh, symmetric as it may have been in the past or as linear as we, we described it. If it's going to be hyperactive and non-contiguous, uh, we can expect that where, where is the front trace of the, of the operational fight, that might be unclear. And so if the, if the battlefield turns quickly or the environment changes quickly, you can't just go to the ACR and say push out a little further. It might be somebody to the south, to the west, to the north of you that has to assume that role and has to have the, or cap the capability within them. And because the battlefield moves so fast, dynamic retask organization may not be an option. So having the uh, capability that's organic to the degree possible is what we've got to pursue. Michael, I think we're about five minutes out. Uh, and uh, let me see if I can combine two questions here. Um, what lessons for Army aviation are coming out of the Russian experience in the Ukraine, Crimea, and Syria? And also, uh, how are we getting at active protection systems in the fleet ahead of future vertical lift? Those may have some connection there. Okay. Um, so for the, the, the Russian experience, um, uh, I think and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to couch it in a couple of ways. One, I think there is a lot to gain from studying that. And I think uh, the first thing that really comes to mind is something that every one of our formations has the ability to solve right now. And it's training, tactical flight, terrain flight, um, and what it does for you in that environment. Uh, I think it has a great deal to teach us about um, signature discipline with FM comms and cell phone radio, or, uh, uh, emissions that uh, we typically are very disciplined to manage, but I do think we have to go back and focus on that again. We, we have large signatures. Um, with regard to uh, you know, Ukraine, Crimea, and, and now Syria, I think um, I think the the study in Syria is just more or less um, certainly informative and interesting. It's a bit of a uh, show and tell of new capabilities uh, that's informative, um, but uh, will help kind of steer where we want to take these capabilities. Now, as far as bringing in the uh, capabilities ahead of FVL uh, with active protection, uh, I. I'm going to go back to my kind of systems architecture comment. I think the government has to define and own the standard of what the bandwidth processing speed capacity is, and all of industry builds to that standard. So now it's an open competition for who has the best sensor. Now it's an open competition for who has the best processor or whatever. Um, and that gives us the ability to rapidly change just through a software card, boop, 
and now I can account for something new without having to put new hardware on an aircraft. Uh, we have to solve that architecture, that A-kit for FVL before it comes on. Uh, and ideally, it could be retrofit to other airframes. So, any... Uh, I would just quickly mention one thing about apps. You know, it, on the ground maneuver, we're learning a lot about this, too. And obviously, there's nobody, no particular branch that um, would benefits from apps any more than the other. So we'll, there will be a lot of shared learning here. The one thing that we're finding uh, with the Abrams as we put this trophy system on is that you know, just snap linking this stuff on is, is not uh, something that is easy to do, and it needs to be part of the, the development process from the ground up. And so to the degree we get after what Bill's talking about, and that is change out a card, um, we believe you ha we have to initially build a common architecture in terms of the brains of the system such that the weapon systems or the degree to which it, it counters the threat can change and evolve, but a common baseline uh, backbone, as you call it. Yeah, and I would add, uh, you know, the wider proliferation of technologies that are, that are coupled with commercial off-the-shelf enhancing capabilities are creating an environment where threats are not just increasingly lethal but increasingly fungible. And so it's not just going to be a function of what active measures can we take in the future, but we've also got to think about the entire DOTML PF end-to-end uh, -end application focusing on training but also focusing on what we're doing doctrinally, and I think that's really kind of what we're here talking about with movement maneuver. Well, uh, obviously, we're doing real well here. We've been given some more time, so uh, <laughs> I have another question. Um, many today discuss the importance of coalition partners to uh, U.S. battlefield success. How do we keep allies and partners in this discussion? Anybody want to jump on that one? I'll, I'll swing at that one first because we do we do quite a bit of this in SOF. And, and I think engagement is the number one thing. So uh, we've got to uh, we've got to seek out uh, active partnerships. We've got to build them at all levels, and we got to build them at the personal level. We got to try to build them at the unit level. We certainly have to build them uh, at the at the bipolar uh, country level. Uh, but the engagement aspect becomes increasingly important for us. As we, as we take a look at partnership. Uh, and I would add that uh, we, we have, for a long time, I think, felt like we had to go it alone in a lot of places in the world. We've got partners out there that want to contribute, uh, and we've got to uh, encourage them to contribute in spaces where we can't wield the kind of influence that they can. They have access and placement with some of our near-peer adversaries and they can be very helpful in that process uh, for us. So uh, I think, too, there's always a common desire to be interoperable. Um, but I don't, I don't know if, you know, interoperable does not mean identical. Interoperable does not mean um, exchangeable. So we have to certainly work closely with uh, our allies and our partners, but we also have to kind of define the interoperability you want. You want a technical piece of interoperability. You want a, uh, a personal relationship part of interoperable. You want a doctrinally interoperable force, but not necessarily same equipment, same stuff. You know, it, of course, we and others would like to kind of do that as much as possible, but it's not what's important. What is important is uh, so I love how General Hodges and Usher kind of defines it. He, he, hey, I want to have the ability to talk FM secure. I want to have the ability to send a digital fire mission to an ally, and I want to be able to see a common operating picture amongst our allies, partners, and uh, ourselves. If you define it, and you know that's what's important, but. Uh, to bring along necessarily with the same equipment or have the same expectation of capability, uh, I don't know if it will always be there, but uh, it is a, important to kind of achieve or try to achieve. So, Let me just jump right on top of that. Uh, having just come back from uh, uh, last week uh, over in uh, Europe meeting with, uh, with two of our NATO allies, so 
I think relationships are absolutely the start of it, and I think where General Gaylord took it into uh, mission command and a common operational picture is absolutely where we need to focus our effort as opposed to precise technical interoperability. You know, we've got a uh, an artillery uh, systems um, uh, program called ASCA, which uh, enables AFATIDS to talk to other nations' fire control systems. And while it's interesting that we can send from one nation's observer through another FDC to a third nation's uh, guns. Uh, what's more interesting is our ability to share fire support coordination measures and build that common operating picture so that in that non-contiguous environment that General Wesley just uh, described, we have the ability for somebody that's way off on a flank to be able to call back to a nation that has the capability for long-range fires to be able to influence the fight in that area of operations. Uh, there are also niche capabilities that some of our allies have. Uh, for example, one of our NATO allies has a um, short range but still a legitimate um, land to maritime capability to attack a moving ship with a rocket. Uh, certainly something that we would like to develop the concept of as we go forward into uh, cross-domain fires uh, concepts going forward. But those types of niche capabilities are areas that we ought to leverage our allies and partners in. Yeah, and just to reinforce that last point, I, I agree with you. Is we Part of the solution is communication. And getting out, we've got a road show. We're going out to our allies and partners uh, in order to communicate what we think multi-domain battle is. In the process of that, um, visiting Australia, I, I find the Australians are, are well ahead of us in understanding multi-domain implications and hybrid warfare. So we're learning from them, too. So I think that's a great point. We might have time for one more question, I think. Um, uh, J.D., you need to help me on your question here. I, I, one word I couldn't make out. Uh, uh, it said, uh, how are we addressing the in requirement for light infantry formations? What was mobility, mobility. mobility. Okay, thank you. And I think that's Maneuver Center uh, Commander's uh, question. Yeah, uh, ground mobility is important. So, But it goes back to, sir, if I could, um, this idea that we are – uh, out of position strategically, and that the enemy has a significant A2 AD capability creating standoff, which means you have to initially import or integrate and deploy troops to an offset location, whether that's an offset LZ, offset DZ, offset port, which then by definition means you're an extended distance from the objective. So one of our problems with our light infantry units is, is getting to the objective. And so what we have concluded is that's a significant gap for the brigade. So there is a fleet of vehicles that the, the Army is seeking to acquire for our light infantry brigades. And it starts with a GMV, a ground mobility vehicle. That, that's a small, light, um, you'd look at it, you'd think it was a, a, a dune buggy or a soft vehicle that you've seen on the battlefield. Um, that gets the, the infantry to the objective before they would um, close with and destroy. But if you're moving a ground mobility vehicle, you may come in contact with that which you wouldn't expect, whether it's a bunker or an errant T-55 or a vehicle that would be a threat to light vehicles like that. That means you need some reconnaissance out in front of you, so that's uh, the light reconnaissance vehicle. And then if you've got a light reconnaissance vehicle that identifies this threat, you need something to reconcile that threat. And so that's why you might be hearing mobile protected firepower, MPF, which um, in, in latter parlance might have been called a light tank. But it's, this, it's a family of vehicles that will go to initially, we think, uh, probably five brigades and then beyond. Uh, but this is to reconcile the shortfall problem in, in our light brigades in terms of mobility. Okay, we uh, didn't get all the questions, but we got most of them, and I'd like to thank the panel and turn it back over to you, Guy.